Hey everyone, welcome to session 252 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Today I get to share with you the recording of the 2023 Verbal Behavior Conference panel discussion. And as I'll talk about in a minute, the 2024 Verbal Behavior Conference is right around the corner. But in this panel discussion, the participants were Troy Fry, Drs. Lena Slim, Sam Bergman, Sarah Frampton, Anna Ingerson, Pat McGreevy, and Andresa D'Souza. And the voice at both the beginning and the end of the panel is none other than Kelly Rich, who founded and currently leads these great conferences. In this Q&A segment, we talked about a whole host of topics, but we really talked a lot about AAC and considerations moving from vocal verbal speech to AAC. We talked about how to deal with limited resources, limited therapeutic times. We talked about the high abandonment rate of AAC devices. There was some discussion about clinical judgment and adapting clinical strategies to varying cultural contexts. And at the end of the episode, there was a really interesting kind of unanticipated segment that came about when a participant asked about the role of singing versus speaking. And that, again, was really fascinating, and that's towards the end of the episode. As you'll hear in this podcast, when you attend the Verbal Behavior Conference, you'll have numerous opportunities to ask the speakers questions. And not just in the panel itself, If you're there in person in Austin, Texas, you'll very likely have the opportunity to have direct interactions with the speakers between talks while grabbing coffee and so on. What strikes me as unique about these events is that they are purposely small and intimate so that one can have these very types of experiences. So what's in store for the 2024 Verbal Behavior Conference? Well, first, the conference itself takes place on February 29th and March 1st. And it's preceded by a full-day workshop from the incomparable Dr. Lena Slim on February 28th. This year's conference speakers include Drs. Barbara Esch, Ed Blakely, Marilla Sanger, fan favorite Pat McGreevy, Alice Schillingsberg, and Hank Schlinger, whom we heard from a few episodes ago. If you can't make it in person, don't worry. Behavior Live has you covered. Nobody does virtual events like Behavior Live, and they will broadcast the entire conference with best-in-class audio and video production. Before we get to this episode, I do want to let you know that we're brought to you today by the University of Cincinnati's Master's in ABA program. This program is 100% online and asynchronous, so that means you log on when it works for you. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. And last but not least, if you want to earn BACB-approved continuing education units while listening to your favorite Behavioral Observations episodes, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs to see the shows that are available for continuing ed. Whether it's supervision, ethics, functional assessment, or other topics, there's something there for just about everyone. All right, that's it for opening remarks. Without any further delay, let's get to the 2023 Verbal Behavior Conference panel discussion. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. And we are ready to start our panel discussion with Matt Sicoria uh, as our moderator. Again, please, for those of you that are live with us, I have a mic and I can walk around to you and you can ask your questions. And then those of you that are watching us on the live stream, please feel free to continue to ask questions. And again, we've been monitoring and writing down your questions all day long. So Matt already has a lot to start with. So we will turn it over to you, Matt. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Just click this on. I want to make sure this is put in the right. Oop, here we go. This is off to an auspicious start here. Excellent. Thanks again for inviting me to do this. This is a lot of fun. And it's also it's fun to get the kind of off script perspectives of the presenters. I had lunch with some of the presenters who were main nameless, and they were a little nervous about not knowing the questions in advance. And I guaranteed them that this is going to be an awesome experience. So we'll have to they'll have to hold us to that. So, as Kelly mentioned, we've got questions that I've collected throughout the day. Those who are on the online platform, feel free to fire some questions in the chat there as well. We've got tons of questions to pick from. We're not going to be able to get to them all. We'll do the best we can. And I kind of wanted to select some questions that uh, have the goal of generating some discussion as well. That might actually further reduce the number of questions we'll get to, but that's okay because we'll have a fun conversation in the process. So so I've got a question I wanted to start off with. 
and it's from uh, Yezi, and she asks, what, what are some considerations that will help us determine if and when we should try other forms of communication other than vocal speech with an early learner? For instance, when do we move from PECs or AAC device, move to PECs or AAC devices from both a speech and a BCPA perspective? So who wants to go? I, let's, uh, let's have Lena go first. I, I, you know, I started my day by spilling coffee on Lena, so I figured I would Give her the, 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 the privilege of going first and give her something that she can respond to both as an SLP and a BCBA. That's part of, I guess, my penance. So, so let me just rephrase. Is that a question relative to when do we move to an SGD or an assistive communication? It's when, do you, when would you move from trying to teach vocal verbal behavior onto something like PECs or right. AAC, et cetera? Right, right. That's my understanding of the question. Okay. I would not give up vocal training or attempt to evoke any vocal output. I mean, vocalization is, is really important to try most of our instructional practices in order to make that voice and uh, come out. It's really understanding where to start. And it can start with anybody young or n- not so young. So it's not only for very young learners, you could start with vocal training later on. So it's not about giving up. I think it's about continuing on your speech training while implementing other functional communication in order to increase those opportunities for contacting social contingencies, social reinforcement, social environments, so that, again, you are actually encouraging, not only encouraging, you're setting the stage for practice, for learning opportunities across environments, for social engagements. But I certainly would not not address vocal output. So it could be in conjunction with an SGD or any other AAC system. So that being said, if you are implementing an AAC system, whether it's low-tech or high-tech or even an unaided AAC system like manual sign or any other types of systems that support language production, layering it with a vocal output with our wonderful instructional practices of, you know, time delay and other prompts that we have is important. So I wouldn't give up on the vocal output, but I would supplement to have this functional, meaningful interaction to quickly contact the environment. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Just to add, completely agree with that. And just to add a little bit to that is that there is the research on for example, using sign with typical developing toddlers and Rachel Thompson, for example, and, and, you know, within the field of behavior analysis has done that. And one of the rationales for that is that it actually can decrease tantrums in toddlers because, you know, listener responding, understanding actually it develops earlier than their, you know, control over their vocal, you know, musculature and so forth. So they can actually engage in the signs to get their kind of wants and needs met. And then that provides those opportunities for just, you know, social interaction and communication and so forth. And the same can happen with those with diagnoses. I have one additional thought that came to my mind as well, that um, this is something that Dr. Alice Schillingsberg really stressed to us in her clinical work that I think I have seen a lot of folks in practice, really struggling with trying to get the form of a vocal utterance to be just right. Like we want this vocal approximation to be perfect. And they're almost um, getting so stuck on perfection that they missed that, in fact, the vocal utterance had already become functional, that the function was being met, the listeners in the environment understood exactly what the child was saying, and we should have moved off that target weeks ago. (laughs) And in fact, we've been kind of over and over and over repeating trials on a target where, again, it's already functioning in the environment for the child to access reinforcement, to access social interaction, we should have moved on. And so I think there's also some aspects of balancing form and function that maybe play into that as well, that 
you know, if we can get regular, reliable vocal sound produced in a specific context, it's under control of the right environmental variables, we can move quickly. Because I can only imagine for the, from the learner's perspective of, you've been asking me to make this sound how many darn times? <laughs> this is the best I can do right now. We might do better to move on to another target, another sound. And again, having access to secondary forms of communication, which is something I've really appreciated and learned a lot from with some of the work from these EFL geniuses here of having alternative forms of communication, multiple modes of communication to meet a learner's need so that we're not neglecting and we're not doing anything that's going to set a learner up to not have a way to meet their wants and needs in the environment, I think is also very important. I think it's also important to point out that it's very important to be good at shaping when you are doing this. And this is something that we need to focus on with our behavior techs and others to be good at shaping. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. That's really wonderful, the reinforcement and the shaping. And that's that's what it is, function, meaning, reinforcement quickly, and then building on that and shaping that. that absolutely. All right. I, get, I just got a, a, just a brief comment. In, in, I agree most, with, with most everything that's been said, beautifully said, by the way. I can't help but think about there's 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 children right now who are severely disabled in this country and around the world. And in many places, the only way they're ever going to get significant intervention is if somebody calls them autistic. That's the only way it's going to happen. And it's a shame. There are some children that have disabilities that are almost never associated with any kind of vocal production at all, ever. See, and I and 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 I think about those kids. I think about the kids with Angelmans, and I think about the kids with microcephaly, and I think about the little boys with Lesh Nihan. I think about those kids, and and I'm all for doing as much vocal production as is physically possible, but I don't want that to give people a false hope. I hope that that, that the chances are this is. Possible, but almost never. So, and I, I appreciate that, but, but I also, you just, I just feel like you have to be sensitive to what people's expectations are. And, and I like the fact that it's not a yes or no. It's not either we do this or we do that. And we don't suggest that in Essential for Living. You can stay with, try to get vocal productions along, but if you're looking at a, 15 or 16 year old child that you've been at this since they were three or four or five, then all the, all that we would say is put, put more of your energies into, into an, an, another functional way. The other thing to consider is just the problem behavior and, and, and where that fits in and the effort to manage and navigate that, where that tends to occur when they don't have an effective way or the effective or what's being expected is more effortful. Not necessarily six. So just being sensitive to that because oftentimes that becomes where we have a, you know, maybe a, a more, I don't know, focused, think again, kind of what we should be doing and, and, and what we need to be doing to solve for that while we stay curious with some other things. Yeah. Just, can you hear, can you hear me? I, you know, I think I've, I agree with, with everything and, and uh, I think, you know, vocal speech, of course, is the, the best way because it's the universal way, you know, that, you know, you can take with you. But I also wonder, like, I, I f think about those families abroad that you go, where they don't have resources and you have four hours with them, you know, maybe, maybe four hours a month, you know, and so you have to put your resources, what is needed at that moment. I, I like the idea of thinking incidentally, like, don't give up on your speech. And that can be done at any time. But if you only have four hours, you do need to focus your resources of what is needed right now. And I need to give it a voice. I need to make sure there's no problem behavior and I'm taking care of that, right? I need to make sure I'm attending to the basic needs, never giving up in looking for these incidental opportunities. But, you know, we need to put that in consideration as well. All right. Let's see. Kendra has an excellent follow-up question to that. Oh, would you recommend starting with sign or PEX as an additional, as uh, when you're moving to AAC, would you, would you recommend starting with sign or PEX or if the motor skills and selection skills are appropriate, go right to a speech generation device? 
what will be the considerations for that? And again, I'll just, these are just, I'm just throwing this, these are jump balls. So, you know, just (laughs) anyway. Well, there's a number of them. (laughs) And geez, it has to do with all the way from imitation skills to matching skills to fine motor coordination to problem behavior. All of those things factor in, at least we think they do. You, you know, there's just, it, it it's so individual to the case, to each case, you know, and, but I appreciate the comments earlier having to do with functionality. I want to, we want to get, see, I've resisted over the years, these terms, receptive and expressive communication, as if they're two sides of the same coin, almost assuming that you, you get one, you get the other. Well, we, we, we all know that's not, that, that's not the case. You can get one and not have the other at all or on a very limited basis. So it, it, it's so many different things. It's, it's really hard to answer that because there's all those things. <laughs> and more. Absolutely. So there's also the learner's specific preference in addition to all those other areas that you've mentioned. Absolutely. And there are the cultural values of the families, the resources available to the families. Their, their, again, ability to, not ability, their norms, whether they're accepting of those support systems or not. So there are layers and layers of considerations when deciding. Of course, what we as behavior analysts and practitioners might think is the best for a child, an individual, a learner, may not be the best for that person within the environment and the culture that they live within and within the medical support and medical condition or support system, political system, educational system. So these questions are awesome, but they remind us much like the question before that we have a framework of understanding of what we might need to do under circumstances, but gathering information from the families and about you know, what their needs are, what their preferences are, what their value systems are, will inform us as to how we can support in ways that they will adopt and be able to to manage within their environment, within their family system and social system. So these are excellent questions. We have a lot of answers, but it, my, my answer is always, it depends. There's <laughs> no discrimination. I think with all of these considerations in mind are very important. If practitioners are looking for a resource that might help them identify, maybe if teaching signs or going to something with the selection base like PEX, Amber Valentino and Linda LeBlanc and some other colleagues that I can't remember from the citation did publish a study that looked at kind of prerequisite skills. And it sounds like maybe this question asker, Matt, had an idea of some of those things with like imitation and selection responses. But There is a great resource out there to help practitioners maybe identify what might be best based on the learner's incoming skills or what skills you might want to work on if you would like to based on what the verbal community might be most likely to reinforce, what resources the family and the providers have, kind of different learner preferences if you would like to move towards something more like an AAC or towards sign or uh, focusing on vocal production. I'd recommend that study by Valentino et al. Um, And I can provide a link to that if Matt needs it for y'all. So. That's something that practitioners might found, find useful to help guide some decision-making. Oh, Matt, one, one more brief thing. Sure. Uh, I can't cite any, any specific data on this, but years and years of experience of chatting with speech and language pathologists, there is a very high abandonment rate of alternative methods of speaking and almost every speech and language pathologist you talk about who has extensive experience will say that, that, that many times the methods that we give people are later abandoned for any number of different reasons. But that's just an important issue, too, in all of this. I was actually just looking this up yesterday, and I forgot to mention it in my talk. But a lowball estimate is about 30%. I think it's probably higher than that. I was going to reference as well that I think as one consideration that I don't know that I hear talked about enough when we're also making these decisions about, you know, which direction do we go with which modality for the man is 
really also taking a look at what some folks have referred to as indicating responses or behavioral indications of motivation or I think Vince Carbone calls it the declaration of motivation, which I, that's catchy. But a lot of times what we're talking about, what, what folks are referring to there are often types of gestures that might be occurring or hand leading or how approach behaviors occur. So all of these behaviors that are often referred to also as pre-linguistic, that, but these are behaviors that they have function. And when you ask folks, how, do, how does this individual tell you what they want right now? Oftentimes, these are things they'll report is that, oh, when they need this, they'll grab your hand and they'll lead you over here. When they want that, they'll point at it. I had a parent once tell me that at the end of a session, he said, oh, my son, I think he really likes you. And I was like, oh, great. This is awesome. He's, how did you know? And he said, well, he didn't flick his ear at you. And I said, what? Ear flick had become the accepted way of communicating rejection in their home. It was an idiosyncratic indicating response. It had been shaped and reinforced in that home community. Ear flick meant don't want it. He didn't flick his ear at me. I was all set. So the Inventory of Potential Communication Acts by Sigafus at all 2000, I believe it is, is a, I think it's a really interesting tool. It's again, another interview tool. It talks through different evocative contexts that might be associated with current communication responses from the learner. And it's a very wide open tool of how in the world do you know? And sometimes when we ask caregivers those questions, we get fascinating answers. I mean, things that are so particular that if we hadn't have asked, we never would have figured it out. And, you know, it would have taken me two years with this kid to figure out that that ear flick was bad. So I think that's another consideration is if there are existing response topographies, it doesn't matter if they're not symbolic, but if they're functional, we could pay attention and build off of those and probably maintain safety. If we're teaching staff members that oh my gosh, when this kid does X, it's really important. <laughs> Please pay attention to it. That could also help us in this journey. Yeah, I, you know, I, I feel kind of shameless talking about chapter six in Essential for Living. And not that it's complete. We're, that's very much the chapter that is is, is the, the, the biggest for the reasons that you mentioned. There's, 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 there is indicating, there is taking, there is leading, there is pointing, there is other things. And what we tried to do is not only indicate what could be occurring, but the limitations of it and what you may be solving for now, but what the limitations of it are in the absence of familiarity and and, and, and people who are interpreting for you to some to that degree. But just the whole thing, the behavior, the sensory, the skill, because if you got a very active learner and you're trying to say two or three things, what would you want him to say or he to say if you were doing that? I think the issue is it depends. I think this is, a, I think the issue for us would be there is clinical judgment here. There is analysis that needs to be done. And I think if somebody suggested if it was no vocal, you go to PECS first and then you go to sign second, that would be wrong. That next step has to be carefully considered and and and, and, and you need to make your case. You need to have your evidence and then go about testing that method to make sure that you don't end up with something that, you know, might be something different. And and again have some humility around what you're trying to solve for and what you don't know. All right, great. I just want to remind folks that if you guys are taking lots of questions from Team Virtual, so Team In-Person, you're welcome to ask questions. I saw, I did see a hand up earlier. It went back down. Kelly can come come to the microphone. All right, great. I, I just want to add that I'm on the chat. We've got Barb Esch chiming in. We've got Tamara Casper. This is a hot topic. Oh, this is awesome. Hey everyone, I just want to let you know that if you're liking what you're hearing thus far, sign up for the conference. The 2024 version of the Verbal Behavior Conference uh, is shaping up to be a really great event, and you'll have the opportunity to ask the panelists the types of questions and have the types of interactions that you're hearing right now. So go check that out. Go to behaviorlive.com forward slash VBC to learn how to sign up. And it doesn't matter whether you're there in person in Austin or online, it, it'll be a fun experience. I also want to just make a note to thank our sponsors, the University of Cincinnati Online. Uh, go check out their master's in education and ABA program. And last but not least, if you do need CEUs, go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs and see what we have to offer. We've got a lot of stuff there across a wide range of topics with the, you know, some of the most popular podcast guests we've had in the almost eight years I've been doing this. Go over to behavioralobservations.com forward slash get CEUs to check that out. All right, this is the only commercial break of the podcast, so let's get right back to this fun 
panel discussion. The pre-linguistic stuff you just mentioned was very helpful because I hadn't thought of that when I thought of my question. But what would be your recommendation maybe for resources or what to do when you have a client who is not showing progress in sign, pecs, lamp, point, doesn't have the fine motor skills for more complex signs, no vocalizations. I just emailed his speech therapist, asked him about a history of echoics because I haven't seen any progress. So what would be your thoughts on that? Very limited reinforcer selection as well. I would maybe ask how, what does the individual do right now if there's a strong MO in place for something? He does, he does the pre-linguistic. He'll lead and sometimes gesture. So that was helpful. I think I just need to go from there. But as far as going from there. I mean, one of the simplest things you can do is like, have you ever heard of a Big Mac button? That's basically just one button that says help or something like that. Okay. That could be a good start. That could okay. just kind of be served to get that individual in touch with the contingencies sure. of doing something like that to, to get reinforcement. I like that. Thank you. I've also found we've clinically conducted some protocols where we've worked on making those hand leading, pointing, reaching repertoires just a little more sophisticated as you know, shape requiring a bit more shaping to make them more durable. Um, and it might be things like securing the attention of a listener might be useful as well, because if I'm pointing at something, but nobody's looking at me, I'm not going to get what I'm pointing at. But if I've learned how to approach someone who looks available, tap them on the shoulder, lead them to what I want to point, there might be some of those other connecting behaviors that make those less recognizable responses more salient in the environment as well. I, I would start much, you know, start where the, the child is at and follow the, the lead and pair yourself systematically as a reinforcer in the environment and slowly establish that contingent response to you in, in the presence of that child and then reinforce immediately systematically by shaping and, and adding to that the, the, the approach behaviors, the look, the orienting, the, the lead, all of those are there already. I think what might be not well established at this point is this rein, this, this, uh, the, the, uh, people, us being reinforcing in that environment. And so I think it's important to start where the child is, a, approach, Carefully observe those leading and, and, and approach behaviors and respond accordingly and make that environment as reinforcing as possible as those social responding is happening. And, and you can build off of that. But I think going back to reestablish that environment is where you need to restart. I think there's a lot of faulty reinforcement history and learning history that you, you have to change that environment, right? So that you can reestablish a new learning history, right? And so that's where you start. All, you, I mean, it looks like you're going backwards, but actually you're not. So it's just a new behavior and new established, you know, routine that you are, you are doing. So contacting that reinforcement for those early approach behaviors is good for social. Uh. Recently, I wrote an article or, or submitted an article for a special issue of a journal dedicated to verbal behavior. And one of the reviewers who is, has, a, has a long history in verbal behavior criticized part of the article because I suggested that the advantage of a manned repertoire was that the learner would control what happened to them. How dare I define manned from the point of view of the behavior? So that's a long roundabout way of venting for a moment, but getting, but getting <laughs> to your question. Your question is, Jack Michael, I, we used to use the expression for many years, it's all about mans. And one day Jack asked me, Patrick, why do you say it's all about mans? And I said, well, Jack, there's a, there's a long answer to that and a short answer. And he said, well, how about the short answer? 
And I said, because it is. That's the short answer. Then I gave him the long answer, and Jack preferred the short answer. So my way of answering that is this, is this. Whatever gets the learner a man or two as soon as possible is where I would start. I've got another question. I, I, I know we're going deep into AAC, but I've got another question from the chat that I want to ask, and I'll ask it. And while I'm, we're getting answers from the panel, I hope to see some more hands here for, I guess, the home team, because uh, we're getting lots, lots of questions here. And I, I know some of you are putting questions, who are here are putting questions in the chat too. But anyway, Troy, I think you started to speak to this towards the end of your talk, and I'm not putting you on the spot that you have to answer. I'd like to get everyone's thoughts on this who, or anyone who feels like contributing to it. But it's another great question. Do you have recommendations, and here's the interesting part, other than the literature and research, comma, <laughs> to share with parents who have concerns about AAC limiting vocal development? And, and, and the reason I like that question so much is that, and this is me editorializing here, but, you know, there's a lot of this, you know, well, do it because science says, right? And I think what this person is asking about is, you know, how to persuade and I'm curious if, if there's, if you've encountered these situations before, and, and it's so easy for us as behavior analysts, as practitioners of people who have a background in the scientific method to say, oh, this is what the literature base says, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, let's do it. So for the people who can't be persuaded, who aren't, I guess, prone to per- being persuaded through that method, how have you gotten people to come, come along with what you think is in the best interest of the client? I'll start, but I certainly won't finish. Uh, I'm guessing. You know, I think I, I think in general, the issue for me is the navigating the science versus practice. I think what I've done is taken what I can from what I know, and then knowing the, you know, the challenges of taking what was in a in a controlled setting out to where I am, and then and then use what I know to evaluate what seems to be a good candidate. And then I go about trying to demonstrate the ability to teach it. And and if I can teach it, and if I can move them along, the degree to how I moved it along, you know, I, I think we can, we can continue to discuss, but I, I think in, in, in some cases it's not saying, well, the literature says, so I wouldn't, I try not to get too far ahead of that, but I also, you know, depending on your history relative to that many different types of learners. I think you, you at some point, we talked again this morning about share, you know, moving that on to somebody else who maybe can, can, can get to the conversation through a little more knowledge. But I tend to try to get through it by making my case and demonstrating, can it be, can it be acquired? Can, can I go for it? Um, I don't know if I'm in a business to persuade anybody, you know, the, to start with. And because what I think it's parents working with me and the moment, you know, I can convince them to give it a try, but that's going to happen. What Pat just said, you know, they might just, you know, stop using it because they don't believe in it. So I think about that. There's that paper from Keith Allen and Billy Warzak about the adherence of parents, right? And then the first thing you need to do is like you did, you know, I need to, you know, show them, you know, like, you know, increase the motivation and, and get the buy in. Now, if the parents are already saying that they don't want, you know, I have the option of trying to negotiate. You know, can can we try a little bit and see if there is a difference? But I think the, you know, it, it you know, I think the most important is get that parent working with you. And if it's not the preference of the parent, you know, what is it? It is. I don't know how much I should just trying to push something. You know, that the parents do not prefer. So I try to to balance that. There is what I believe, but there is what the family is preferred, you know. Thank you. Beautiful. Also, persuasion forcefully is, is not, a, it's not the way to go. Demonstration is one way, but before you can demonstrate, you need to have consent for doing so. So there are many steps before even getting to the place of demonstrating and contacting reinforcement that, that is necessary because the again i go back to people's values and cultural background and learning history and all that they bring is not the same as ours and our priorities as practitioners 
also professionally, not only professionally, but personally, we have our own ideas and preferences. So convincing or trying to convince another party of your opinion may come across as coercive. And I think a better way would be more from a a compassionate approach of asking more questions to get to be informed of what might be the reason for that resistance. And it could be things we would never imagine. I mean, it, it could be fear of something. It could be, but fear could have multiple layers of what, you know, it could be stigmatizing. It could be fear of not knowing and being successful and failing. It could be fear of not having the resources enough to support. I, it could be something else. But the point is, we won't, we won't know until we ask the questions. And the questions are asked not so that we can grab on to the information and match it to what we believe. It's more to be informed as to what it is from their assumptions and perceptions, and then figure out through our analysis and observation and data collected to kind of say, what do you feel comfortable doing first? And, and beyond that, saying, what is it that you want your child to be doing? What's your priority? And then moving from there, scaling back and negotiating in a way that is more offering uh, a reciprocal support. So there are, there are multiple steps and layers and efforts from us to be doing before we can even get to the demonstration and contacting reinforcement. But once we get this, oh, I'll, I'll pick one small step. Let, do you feel comfortable doing this so I can show you? And once they say yes, and then demonstrating and then having them contacted and then giving that reinforcement because they see the outcome immediately happening, then they're going to grab and you can grab onto them. And then they're like, tell me more. Give me more. So in just a response to that, I, I agree. And, and I, I think thanks for putting that in front of what I suggested. That's the kind of stuff in the Adam Grant book, by example. When you even just, when you're in it, when you're interacting with folks, instead of saying why, you kind of get to that sense of how did you come, without saying that word nasty, but how did you come to believe that? How did you come to, what's your evidence? And to your point, sometimes it's rational, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's history. Sometimes it's what somebody said, and they're not that committed to it once they have the opportunity to not be questioned or threatened, but have the opportunity to actually, you know, try to unpack, you know, how they did come to have such a strong conviction to go one way or the other. So clearly I'm not on the panel, but something that I keep finding myself wanting to say is what strikes me as many of you think about your client as the family. And whatever works for the family is cool. But if it doesn't stick into adulthood, I don't care anymore. I need to care what works for the client. And there is a balance because we serve primarily adults. And whatever a parent or family was comfortable with or could accomplish, if it's not functional, and powerful for that person, it's going to not maintain. Okay, so my unrelated audience question is in particular the development of this PAT assessment tool for organizational kind of priority sort of allocations. What was the very kind of start of the levels? I, was it mainly kind of clinical judgment, just expertise? I imagine there was an observational step where you were kind of looking at these are kind of the different, you know, the levels, right? The level systems. These are kind of what we tend to see when a, when a situation is not having the resources, you know, it needs or when a, a system is, is needing to be tuned up, right? So a red system, right, was categorized by a couple of different factors. And then the same thing with, you know, yellow and green. I wonder where that came from initially was like, what, how did you go about setting those levels? Because they become a big aspect of your measurement. Did you just kind of take data on a big population and kind of, kind of just see where that fell? If you could talk about that aspect of your analysis. 
Yeah, I initially it was just looking at the tendencies through practice and in in through in through through the evidence in the literature what repertoires are missing often and as a result of those missing skills it's it's collateral effect on getting to safe quality repertoires and then looking at outside of that some of the other things that were just dimensions Dimensions of change, again, topography, frequency, intensity, the need for certain levels of support, and then trying to help organizations around how do we get those critical repertoires in place and showing them that, again, to what the research would suggest, if you don't have an effective way to communicate and you don't have the ability to navigate some of the obstacles that most folks experience and, and thinking about building that not replacement skill but replacement repertoire why they all are in there and how they all are valuable and how they all become useful and then and then again trying to take the organizational piece around where the cost was where the strain was where the friction was where the safety was and then looking at those other dimensions of health in terms of just habits for leisure habits to build the day right because we're often Thinking about little, we're trying to build a life, trying to build a routine, trying to build a community, trying to, and all those types of things because of the challenges of supporting or trying to solve when you just don't have some of the, some of that knowledge. And, and so that's how we've just started there. This is, this is, this is phase one, right? This is test one. This is the kind of thing it will continue to evolve when we get some more evidence about sensitivity and, and, and probably prioritization and, and other skills that may be missing. Have you applied that same analysis across a variety of programs and seen that your levels map on to observable differences? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have. And that's really been the case is we really want to get to to a performance level that you don't have to see on paper. You experience it, you feel it, you see it, you know it. There's changing in staffing ratios. There's staff, staff, that's why I was talking about that social validity piece, staff satisfaction, parent satisfaction, organizational satisfaction, governmental satisfaction around the funding, that that money is going to places that, you know, is effectively not just taking individuals, but effectively serving them. And so it, just to go back, if I could, to the last question, because I just, I mean, I, I think as a professional, I think the idea is thinking about the context. We as professionals have to always, that's our job, is to stay advocating for that learner, to stay out there saying, no, this, in, but, but how you massage that, how you make that happen is different in different places. But you're absolutely right. You've got to be advocating. You're the professional. You're the one who's in, tact, in contact with the research. You're the one in contact with the evidence that's out there in your practice. And so you have to always be that person. But how you do that person and how you become that person to accomplish what you're trying to do is, I think, what we were kind of leaning in on a little bit. Thank you. You just took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say thank you for this comment. And it's an important comment to be had. We are advocating for those that we, we help and support and, and serve. So absolutely. And I think we, we take exactly the how. And I think when, we, when I personally always use the word family, I'm, I'm kind of including uh, the individual, but it's incorrect. And I should probably highlight the individuality of the, the people we are advocating for as well. And you are absolutely right. So thank you so much for raising that. All right. We've got a couple uh, in-house questions here. Uh, I just want to say I'm just really honored to be here in the presence of all of you. So my first thing, this question is for Dr. Slim. Can you talk about some systematic ways to assess learner preference for communication modality? For, for method of speaking? For methods of communicating? Yes. So if you had like either manual sign or if you had it an unaided versus an aided, low tech versus high tech, things like that, or yes. vocal or not. I mean, you, you literally would have to do a selection based process, like a selection process by presenting the item and taking data on approach behavior, how they, they are approaching the uh, SGD versus how well are they responding to manual sign? Is their outcome, in, first of all, avoidance or not, whether they are imitating and you see outcome data from one modality over the other. So you're systematically presenting 
the modality and taking data on their responses and the not only response of approach behavior or avoidance, but also of how they are responding to the instruction or communicating in that way. So you're doing it systematically. So vocal, manual, SGD, and then you kind of you kind of gather that, you do this analysis and you observe and then you see, like much like any preference, which one they approach more, which one do they prefer in terms of modality of demanding and, and communicating. And, but you don't do it at only one time because, you know, you need to do that on a repeated fashion so that you have consistency in your data, right? I've also observed that there may be certain preferences for certain types of contexts and, you know, reinforcers that are produced that might be important to pay attention to. So, for example, to access more of an enjoyable social interaction, to have to end the interaction, to pick up my device, to find and navigate, select, and then re re-enter this social interaction that I was having so much fun with. For some learners, they may not prefer that, but to access a tangible at snack time, they're all about using their device. So I think we can also pay attention to the type of establishing operations that we're assessing in the presence of, because that might make a difference. And even just some of those contextual factors that if, if we're playing tag on the playground and I have to go play tag and carry around a heavy device in order to communicate with a peer, that that might detract from my enjoyment of playground time. So I think we could also you know, I think we tend to analyze sometimes these preferences under very tightly controlled table-based conditions because they're oh so convenient for us. But I think we also need to make sure we're considering all the contexts in which this learner is communicating, hopefully in any way, shape, or form. I agree completely. I, I love the content. Absolutely. And this is where the analysis comes in, right? You're analyzing the response effort to contact of reinforcement, right? So under different contextual conditions, this is going to be varied. So, but you do that across and then you come with, come up with data informing you of which ones are more approached, which ones under which conditions and what would be the best. And again, one modality does not exclude another modality. All right. So that's, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, 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 right. I mean, so it's not a one or, or none or nothing. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I had a question related to instructional feedback and how to collect data on that. So I work in a clinical setting and I feel like we do a lot of this in the net. So whenever we're doing play activities, we do this. And when it goes towards more of a structured setting at the table when we're working on those targets, how would you recommend programming for it? Is there a way that you found that you can collect data and also train your therapist so that they don't become rigid in it to still allow some flexibility? Yeah, great question. So I think it's wonderful to hear that you're providing instructive feedback during kind of more naturalistic environment training and play-based training. Dr. Laura Grow, I believe, has a study on incorporating instructive feedback in uh, more play. So that might be something to check out. I could be wrong and I can double check those references for you. I think that the thing to remember is that we can be saying stuff and often we are, and I hope we are talking to our learners all day long and we might be providing them information about their surroundings and um, to enrich their experience. And so the, the big thing that comes with instructive feedback is making sure to arrange conditions to probe for if they are actually acquiring those secondary targets. So you can be presenting, you know, stimuli all day long, but um, is that actually, are you actually doing this under conditions um, where they're likely to then learn those secondary targets or are we just talking to talk? And so I think that that's something, you know, really important to consider. And you can do those probes in um, a more unstructured way, like you might during NET, you just present the opportunity to basically allow them to respond in the presence of the SDs that you've been, you know, kind of programming for through the instructive feedback. Or you can do that at the table as well if you have more structured uh, learning opportunities. Big things that help my staff use instructive feedback or conduct probe conditions like in general are just guided data sheets. We might use different sort of cues um, on our data sheets to say like, this is a probe trial, basically so that they 
um, know how to respond during those times that might be different than when we would want there to be prompting or we would want, you know, if you are testing under extinction conditions or not, just kind of to give them some extra cues on how they should be responding and what that kind of procedural fidelity looks like so that you can really assess if your instructive feedback is working. Because I think instructive feedback is easy and it should be something that people are considering, but it's really important to assess if your learner is actually benefiting from that intervention. But Dr. Frampton, I'm not sure if you have any other feedback. I know you use it quite a bit in practice. I, I've, I've loved your answer and I think it's fantastic. I was also just contemplating a little bit of what if the purpose of the intervention is really instructive feedback such that they acquire these secondary targets without instruction, or is it more to provide a generally language-rich environment that's fun and engaging and silly and reflective, includes those pride skills? Because I think though they have so many overlapping components, they, they might have different aims, and I think both aims are wonderful. So that was just another consideration is I think at times we just want Anytime I would will walk by a session room or a classroom, I can just put my ear up to the door, and if if it's quiet, that's 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 not good. <laughs> There's it's not good for a number of reasons, but one of them is it it means staff aren't feeling comfortable talking and interacting with the individuals. So I think there's definitely the purposes of just having ongoing language rich envi- interactions in a social context that are super valuable. And again, I think tied back to the same underlying mechanisms of bi-directional naming and integrating speaking and listening. So I think they have the same underlying mechanisms. But if we're really specifically looking at instructive feedback as a way to accelerate learning, I then do everything Sam said. All right. Any other? Uh, yep, we got a question right there. Go right ahead. Thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. My brain is doubled in size. This is great. But I, I've often worked with kiddos who don't talk much at all but can sing. You ever used any kind of singing, like may not be able to speak, but but know the words to let it go. So any brainstorming on how to maybe transfer that to functional language or verbal behavior? Yeah, actually think about a study that was published on BAP a few years ago, Hansing, Bethany Hansing, me and Chili's work. I think there's somebody else. Um, but so it, it was the case of a of client who had speech, intelligible speech scripting, but would not, we could, couldn't get that over con- core control. So what we did was the simple uh, high P, low P procedure, where we started with the motor imitation, and at the end, we would put in a, a echoic. And after we done that consistently, so that's what, you know, we were able to get that. So that was one procedure I would recommend, you know, to take a look because that was effective for that learner. One consideration, I've absolutely seen this phenomenon as well many times, is that what it draws me back to is that potentially our voices are not that as much fun to listen to as Adina Menzel singing Let It Go. And I can give that one up. I acknowledge that. But it makes me think perhaps we need to find environmental sounds and stimuli that are more already paired with reinforcement for this learner that that already have undergone the type of stimulus-stimulus pairing or they're automatically already just more fun to listen to. And that we might actually kind of start there and see if we can even pull, kind of actually just start there. I know I've worked with some clients that are adolescents and we were looking at introverbal fill-ins and everybody on, you know, told us they're like, oh, they don't have any introverbals. And I was like, wait, what's their favorite song? They're like, Drake. And they listed like Drake playlist. So we would just play Drake and pause. The kid would fill in the lyric every time and we just continue playing the song. So I think there's also potentially a lot of different ideas and programming that could come around from that. Maybe eventually we say some of the lyrics and then they fill in. And so I, I think we could, and you start where they're at. If that's what they like listening to, let's build some programming around their current interests and preferences is one thought also. The, the, there's like, this is a beautiful question because music and singing has been used a lot to manage speech motor disorders, neuro, neuro, yeah, uh, neurodegenerative motor planning difficulties, disfluent speaking, disfluency, stuttering. There's a lot of music and singing involved to to support and facilitate and promote and facilitate sequential movements. Okay. Now that's not with the pop we're not ta- we're talking about population of aut- with individuals that have autism, right? So 
we can draw from the literature of that and also listen to these wonderful suggestions here because speech is movement, as I said before, right? So there's movement involved. It's also intonation. It's prosodic. It's what you said is imitation. There's an imitation component and an echoic repertoire, but saliency is important. Saliency of the models that we provide is it needs to kind of be matched to the learner's preferences as well and ability to differentiate, uh, discriminate. And if your child sings and is in tune and finds singing in tune musical tune reinforcing, then again, start there, use that, attempt to use some intonational, musical, salient, verbal modeling along and practicing that because that requires practice as well. We're not used to singing to a tune while we're talking. But again, going from the preference and what is available building on it and transferring the stimulus control from that comfortable, wonderful environment of singing to a song to other contexts and meaningful contexts. So you can do that transfer by using all those skills of imitation, uh, echoic response established, followed by using our models with salient modalities and, and joining in. So we, you can do that. But, but it is on us as well to join and to change possibly some of the saliencies of how we present our vocal presence and modality. All right. Well, I think, oh, all right, Danielle, this is going to be quick. And panelists, this is going to be a quick answer. We've got two minutes left here. I was about to do the psychotherapist thing. Well, that's the end of our time here. But uh, let's see if we can do this really fast, guys. Okay. I think it has maybe come up in the chat, too. But in the conversation of topography-based versus selection-based and a lot of the recent research in the use of either echoics, self-echoics, autoclitic frames, all of these things that require internal speaker behavior, how do you account for those things being mediated by a selection-based communication system? So either the echoic behavior and bi-directional naming or multiple step listen responding tasks that you would use that echoic behavior for how do, how do we account for sorry how do we account for what being mediated the uh, the process of what we might lay call remembering things so processing them through your self echoic repertoire when you don't have a speaker behavior yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure we have the research that to show that to what extent that occurs or doesn't occur. I would also say that just in general, even though research has shown that speaker behavior, topography based behavior facilitates some of those performances, at least to me, it has not been shown that that's the only way that those performances can happen. You know, I think it's possible that you could show some of those selection-based responses actually mediating other selection-based responses. And I don't know, is there, is there research like that? Well, uh, I, th I think it's the, it's the, the, it's the essence of, of joint control in, 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 in the sense that joint control where you could, in Essential for Living, we call it the difference between a recognition and a retrieval. If, you, if somebody says, where's the cup, and you can point it on at the table, it's a response you can complete very quickly. But if you have to go across the room and get a cup, or worse yet, go across the room and get a cup and put it in the sink, now now there's there's probably some kind of joint control involved in order to do that successfully. There has to be a way that you can mediate your own listener response. At least we think. At least we think. And and it's been shown that you can do it with a spoken word that becomes a self echoic that becomes a private event. In other words, people around you wouldn't necessarily hear it. And it's been shown that you can do it with a sign. You, that you that you could that you can mediate your own listener response with a sign. It seems reasonable that it could be done with a picture too. Although I have to admit I don't know whether that's ever been shown. I, I really don't. 
I don't know. I'll be talking that. about problem solving tomorrow and I have some connections to some okay. different modalities, but not fully. All right. But what I a, think it's what, a great What one. a professional way to tee up tomorrow's talks. So I'm going to have to draw it to a close here because people have places to be and whatnot. So thank you very much, guys. And thanks for the opportunity for me to ask other people's questions. It's always a treat. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everybody. All right. We will see you back here at 8.15 early in the morning for a fabulous day two. Hope you have a wonderful evening in Austin. Enjoy. And we'll see you in the morning. Be sure you scan out because you get credit for the panel as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.